Welcome to What They Don't Tell You About Being a Survivor, a podcast that builds community amongst those affected by trauma with a purpose to promote healing and social change. As a reminder, this show is for mature audiences and the conversation might be triggering and or difficult for some to hear. Please respect and listen to your own body as you listen to what is shared. If you need to pause an episode or even stop an episode, there is no shame in that. We acknowledge that those listening will hear personal journeys that are like their own. There are resources listed on our homepage if you want to talk with someone. Please know there is help. There are people who care. You are not in this alone. We thrive in diversity, and as such, there will be people who have different views than you do, and that's a good thing. The world would be an awful place if we were all identical. There is no judgment in this space. The names John and Jane are used in place of the actual names of those who committed acts of harm. As always, I am your co-host, Laura, and I would like to introduce our topic for this episode, Transgenerational Trauma in Native American Community. This podcast features international host and guest, but is based out of Duluth, Minnesota in the United States. Duluth resides on the land that was cared for and called home by the Ojibwe people, before them the Dakota and Northern Cheyenne people and other native peoples. For our conversation today, we have Jill, um, the Learning and Resource Coordinator of the Sacred Hoop Coalition, and Christine Davidson, Education and Cultural Coordinator for Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. Jill, would you like to start us off by introducing yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, Welcome. I'm glad that you're all here with us, um, downloading or um, just listening um, outright. Uh, As Laura said, my name is Jill. I am working out of Duluth, Minnesota for Mending the Sacred Hoop as the Learning and Resource Coordinator and also for the Sacred Hoop Coalition. Um, I'm also a direct descendant of the White Earth Nation, which is kind of in the western part of the state. I grew up in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, more or less raised um, in the dominant cultural perspective, so didn't know a lot about my Native heritage until my spirit started sort of burbling up and asking me to pay attention to it, and that, for me, happened um, in earnest uh, at about 35 34, 35, 36 years of age. Um, And so my um, cultural heritage now is really, it always has been, it's kind of always been in the background. I didn't know that's what it was when I was a young person, but now um, as an adult and honoring and embracing that and going through my own personal healing journey, um, my Native American culture is near and dear to my heart. and as I mentioned, uh, direct descendant of the White Earth Nation, and I'm going to pass it over to Christine, who I believe is also of White Earth descent. I am, I am. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Laura. Really good to be here with everybody. Buju, Kiwatayashi Kindigo, Nikizi Indoding, Gawaba Baganika Gishkonigan, and Donjuba. My indigenous name, my Anishinaabe name is Kiwatayashi, and I'm Eagle Clan. And I'm from the White Earth Reservation, where Joe was just mentioning. It's over in Northwest Minnesota. Uh, I actually grew up in Red Lake, uh, but I live here in White Earth now for about the last 10 years. So my English name is Christine Davidson, and I'm the Education and Culture Coordinator with the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. I've been there for, I guess, since 2007, so I'm not sure how many years that is, but it's my... It's my spirit-driven work. It is, you know, I ran off to the Marine Corps when I was trying to escape a lot of violence and spent four years in the Marine Corps and then went to Starbucks Coffee Company for a decade, which I loved. And there was a piece missing of, you know, my soul was calling and I thought I could run from my trauma, from all the violence. I thought I could work my way away from the trauma and it turns out that you can't Um, my heart and my spirit called me to the coalition and now i've been here ever since i don't intend on leaving either (laughs) 
That's beautiful. Christine, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's exactly, um, not I shouldn't say exactly, that would be stealing your story, but um, that's kind of how my process went too. I was running and, and trying to be a part of the dominant culture and spirit was like, whoa, 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 big old, big old. I, I, when I envision it, it's kind of like heels in the dirt, you know, skidding to a stop and uh-huh. my whole big old chunk of my soul is like, darling girl, you're in the wrong space. And there. And from that point, I opened it up to the universe, to the spirit, and I said, look, use me, you know, and then mending the sacred hoop just literally opened its doors to me, and I started in February of 2020, so I'm still pretty new to this line of work. Um, I used to be an English teacher, so, but it was the same sort of like, you know, you can run, but you can't hide, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, so I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think, so I guess I would just also add too that, you know, the, the violence that I have experienced was um, you know, child sexual abuse. Um, my harm doer is a person who practiced our, our cultural ways, right? Practices um, our ceremonies, our healing work. And so all of my violence was experienced within the context of our ceremonies. And so the struggle was real, um, you know, my, my faith is very strong in our ways, and yet, how could this harm be happening? And how could somebody that I love and trust and who is doing such good things for other people be such a monster in our own home, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that, was a, that was a real struggle all my life, and I guess it still is to some degree. Um, I'm, that's why I fight so hard now for us to have safe access to our cultural practices and ceremonies and medicines and ways, because it was, um, it was so painful and, and such a struggle to wonder about how could this be happening, right? I don't know how else to say it. Well, I can't imagine um, from my own process, a big part of my struggle um, was sort of taking those parts of self, right, and and, and bringing them back together after, because you put your faith and you put your trust in whether it's these systems, these people, these traditional medicine workers, whatever it might be that, that you abide by throughout the course of your life and growing up, and then when you realize that, that there was, you know, um, disgrace or violence or pain, uh, at the hands of those people and you see it, it almost like splits your sense of understanding of self mm-hmm. into either multiple or two, you know, and, and I believe that's the process of healing and what we're kind of here to discuss is, is mending that split, that break, that shattering, you know, whatever word you want to use to describe that. And like you're talking about, as soon as you mentioned that, I just got goosebumps all over, Christine. And thank you for, for sharing that part of your story, because I think that speaks volumes to what so many of us experience, um, whether it's our own trauma or trauma from generations passed on which is part of what we're here to talk about, right, is how do we bring that back together, not only in our psyche, but also on our heart, right? Like, those, it's, it's such, it's, it takes a, a tremendous amount of work, and I feel like every person walking on this planet has some amount of that that they're carrying with them, which I feel like is why there is so much violence and so much pain and suffering. Yeah, yeah, but, you know... So when I was thinking about having this conversation with you, you know, all the, like the many, many years and many generations and many stories. And of course, when we're working with folks in our community or just living our lives, when we're hearing stories of harm and it can become so overwhelming and we can become paralyzed with not knowing what to do about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we want a fast, quick fix we want that violence to stop we want us to be healthy and happy and kind to one another but we can't ever forget that there is there's a there's a history you know in in this country and across the world really of of people who 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 have power and they use that power to extract the resources from the land and the people and I believe that that is still what we're dealing with today right and so that is 
a big picture idea, but it happens in very real time with people who are very close to us in our own. When we get up in the morning and get a drink of water, the people who are around us are are still impacted by that kind of violence, really. So mm-hmm. it is hard to um, think about what to do, what to do differently. But we have to acknowledge that harm, right? And we have to acknowledge the impact that that kind of land extraction and being displaced has has done to us as a people, because I think that, that is passed down through many generations of trying to get our power back some kind of way, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the thing for me that I really um, like to emphasize is I completely agree. We all have to acknowledge it. Everybody has to acknowledge the pain and um, the stealing of so many things. And we can go in. I actually have a, a document here of, of years and years of what was what was taken, what was uh, ripped from not only the physical person, the physical beings throughout the years in our country, but also from the spirit of, of our uh, the Native peoples of this land. And, and you're absolutely right, around the world. Um, but what I always like to bring it back to, and um, I know it's, it, it, it's sometimes um, I looked at askance because I, people think I'm glossing over it, but it is really, we have to acknowledge it, but we also can't sit in it, right? We can't like wade in that pain and sit and go back and dig through it all. And, and uh, because I believe some, at some point we have to acknowledge it, hold it, see it for what it was and still is in people's lives, but we just can't you know, like I said, wallow in it. That's that's the part for me that um, I struggle even talking to other people in my life that are going through different traumas and events is, yeah, it's so valuable to to recognize what it has done, but we have to move on from there. You know, we can't just sit in it and sit amongst it. Um, so I think that's the important part too and how we are starting to heal it. That's how we begin to heal it is, is walking forward with that honor and acknowledgement. Yeah, I, I feel I feel like, so I guess I have like um, an additional thought to add to that. Like we yeah. can't, can't stay in the same frozen place of, of hurt and woundedness and rage and anger and betrayal and all the feelings that come with it uh, on, a, on a macro level and a micro level, right? Like that big, huge level where we've been betrayed as a people on this continent has its own kind of weight that it carries, right? And the kind of the individual betrayals and rage that we feel, but there is something to be said about having our reality and our feelings and our spirit and that loss um, acknowledged and validated to some degree, right? And change, active change needs to happen. We can't have the same circumstances keep showing up over and over again and think that we're gonna be moving through it right? So what does it also look like as communities and as a society to acknowledge it and to have policy in place that makes it right, right? So I guess I think about all of those things because those also continue to impact us, right? Like our communities are still struggling. They struggle with addiction. They struggle with trying to cope with the many levels of of grief and pain and anger that we're experiencing still today. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, th- oh. and, um, I think an important thing is to be able to label the harm that was done and the harm that's still happening. And, you know, like the episode title here is um, Transgenerational Trauma. And Jill, did you have a description you'd like to share? I do have a description. Um, I actually have a couple of them. <laughs> and I'm um, going back and forth between what makes the most sense. Um, and I think I'm going to share this um, particular description that was given by Barbara O'Neill, who actually talks about transgenerational trauma um, with the Aboriginal people. Um, and it's the same concept, of course, it's just in a different land. Um, this, but I like the way she describes it. And then I'll also kind of relay what I found um, in a different place and connect things a little bit more to, 
So what she says is trauma may be acquired or inherited and transferred by an individual and or collective by a group. Genetic and physiological, behavioral, and psychological factors are considered when diagnosing trauma. The literature characterizes such trauma as inter- or transgenerational or hereditary trauma. These terms are often used interchangeably. So it's, it's, it's referring to trauma that is passed down from one generation to another, and that is termed transgenerational trauma. And if you take the word transgenerational, we can just break them apart, right? And trans meaning many, so many generations are affected by a trauma. The primary cause of such trauma was colonization and the attendant atrocities perpetrated upon the First Nations or Native American populations at that time. And the resultant loss, violence, disconnection from country, family, community, language, and culture created such pain and anguish that the physical, emotional, intellectual, and psychological functioning and the DNA of indigenous peoples altered drastically. Trauma became a source of depression, anxiety, loss of esteem, disconnection from spiritual and emotional well-being, and caused changes in molecular processes. These changes in the DNA, behaviors, and attitudes of indigenous peoples have been shared with generations that followed up until the present. So I really do like her description of that. And then also one word, one um, phrase we hear a lot is the, that of historical trauma. And I want to just clarify, historical trauma is like a sub genre of transgenerational trauma and historical trauma refers to specifically the role in society so the role in the history of that particular um, culture or geography so that is just kind of to be specific with the language we're using and one other piece too I'll mention I mean and, and it makes sense to us here because a lot of our schools teach about the Jewish Holocaust and so the Jewish Holocaust is another example of people who have experienced collective or transgenerational trauma. In fact, um, it was found that, I'm trying to find the numbers here, that there were, uh, oh, here we go. In 1966, intergenerational or transgenerational trauma was first recognized in children of Holocaust survivors. So in 1966, psychologists psychologists began to observe large numbers of children of Holocaust survivors seeking mental help in clinics in Canada in particular. The grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were overrepresented by 300% among the referrals to psychiatric clinics in comparison with their representation in the general population. So that in particular, that statistic, just to be transparent, was taken from Wikipedia. So you can take it for what it was. But that is just something to sort of put it in context for what we're talking about and how we can see that influencing and impacting multiple types of populations throughout our country and around the world. I hope that brings some clarity. <laughs> it's, it's kind of making my head reel in terms of, I don't know, the, the complexity of it, right? Or maybe the simplicity of it. When you, if you think about human beings, I mean, how often do we hear about, you grow up in a certain town, you know, Jill, you were saying that you grew up in Detroit Lakes. Yep. You know, and for me, I grew up in Red Lake, which is an, a res reservation from a little bit north of White Earth. And they're, they're, you're, our land is our life. Right, and especially for Indigenous people or Anishinaabe people, we're hunter gatherers, right? And so, to be able to go and fish and get deer and rabbit and all the things that we harvest from the land, and so I think it's just so important to really think about the land that we're on. And even folks who grow up in towns, they they may move away, but oftentimes we won't move back to the region that we're familiar with that we're from where our roots are right and the way that trauma has an impact is that sometimes we have to leave the place where our roots are because the trauma is just too painful to keep facing in that particular space right so it's really deep when you remove when you have to remove yourself from the land that you love mm -hmm. and I think 
we cannot state it more how important it, it is to have your land base intact. Right? It's what's familiar, it's the smells, it's the sounds, it's the feel, right? it's the food, it's the you know, when you get out of the vehicle, when you're out in the country and you can smell the pine trees, you know, you can, when you live in the country, you know what certain trees smell like. And those are kinds of things that I think if you don't, if you have not experienced that, you may not understand the importance of it, right? Right. And, and, and bringing it up too, uh, we can talk more specifically about the Native American experience of land removal, right? It's dating back, you know, all the way to the 1600s, 1700s, when uh, things were, the colonizers were getting, uh, ramping up, you know, the new world was spreading across the eastern seaboard, and what was happening then, you know, is is they were taking land away from the native people that had been there. Prior to 1684, it's important to notice that tribes were viewed as independent nations by foreign entities, except Spain right? Because Spain thought that um, they were subject to Spanish rule. So aside from that, up until 1684, the natives, and let's speak specifically about America, right? Viewed uh, the land as exactly a part of who they were. And actually, this is an important point to make here. And Christine, you know, feel free to fill in any gaps I want to, I miss. When we're talking about Native Americans and the connection to land, I think what people that um, maybe don't have any heritage or descendancy uh, don't realize, or maybe they do, I don't know, I'm not going to speak for other people, but what I can say about myself is that, as Christine's mentioning, land is an incredibly important in a lot of ways, and it is because, contrary to the way the colonizers viewed the land as a resource they were trying to take from and exploit, Native Americans worked hand in hand with the land, right? It was something the creator gave to us as to help us live and survive and to grow from it and to be stewards of the land, to share with the land, to use the resources, not to abuse and exploit, but to actually like partner with essentially. We're we're partners with. We we are we are relatives of the four footed ones, right? The winged ones, the rooted ones. And I talked about this in the podcast I recorded previous. Part of my healing journey was when the spirit in me, and I called this my native spirit because that I had a, I could talk about it at length because it was a very vivid, um, visceral experience for me, but it came through me so powerfully that where I was going to do my most healing was by the water's edge, in the woods, with the stones, with the the winged ones, all just literally, and that that was literally what healed me. It was laying on the ground. It was literally sitting next to Lake Superior, and I just felt the power of the earth come up through me, and it was like this beautiful, I can't describe it as anything other than energy, crystalline energy just pouring through my body from the ground up. And that is something that, as Christine is saying, like our land is valuable, not just because of what it gives to us in the form of meat and plants to eat for sustenance, but also literally the energy to live, the life force that comes from it. And so when Native Americans were forced onto reservations, forced to move off their lands because the colonizers wanted it, and then again, further forced um, the children onto, you know, boarding schools and taking them out of their family's home and taking them away from their land. That's exactly right. We, they were, they lost so much of who they were, right? Because that connection to land, as I ex- explained in my own experience, it's not just your physical feet on the ground. It is literally your, your spirit, your life force energy that is pouring through so yeah absolutely um I'm, i didn't mean to steal your um topic there christine but it, it's such an important point to make um and when we talk about transgenerational trauma we talk about historical trauma that's a huge component of that trauma i mean it was torn apart how do you ever repair something like that it mm-hmm. takes individual personal work to begin to repair that and there's so many layers that have to be removed first and i can talk about those layers but i want to make sure christine has time to say her piece too yeah 
all that, all that, right? And so one of the things that was super important for my healing is to understand that relationship to land and spirit had more power than any human being, right? And, you know, I think it, it, it is important to remember that we still have an opportunity and a responsibility to make sure our policies reflect um, more awareness of, of Indigenous people's connection to land. Uh, you know, we have the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a law that says that if you're going to remove a Native child from a family, to put it with another family member, or at least keep them within their nation, right? And the reason for that, because there has been many, 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 many policies that, you know, assimilation policies, genocidal policies used to make it legal to break everything apart, right? And so it is important to both do our individual healing work and not do our own connection to land, um, connect with people who are safe, that are, um, you know, living our cultural practices that are not causing harm. And it's important to keep doing that change at that policy level to, to not remove Native children from families at the high rates that they are, right? Like, for example, my mom, you know, she has three siblings and they were removed. She went through eight foster homes and in each and every foster home that she went, she was sexually assaulted, she was beaten and she was forced to work, right? Just labor on the farms. And that has an impact on me, right? Like we're still in the region where a lot of the violence that she experienced in her life is just a few miles from here. It is so difficult to, because it like I think we we can navigate our own pain sometimes, but that in, that transgenerational trauma that's where that comes up is like well, my mom's pain and the pain of my aunties and uncles, right? That that our families have experienced for so many generations is really tough to navigate now. And also, there's just so much I had to say when I was listening to you, and I I can't keep track of it all. But um, there's just something about even though we have had many generations of suffering and removal and policies, we have also had many generations of resilience and strength and connection. And, and that spiritual connection cannot be broken. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then one other thing I, I also wanted to, um, when you were talking about, when you're talking about folks, the experience of indigenous people to this continent is one thing, but we're all indigenous to somewhere, no matter who we're indigenous to somewhere. And if you think carefully about it, you know, I, I, I ask this question sometimes and like, you know, where are you from? And they'll say, you know, wherever they're, they, they might say they're, they're American and they're not from anywhere, but they are from somewhere. Their people are from somewhere. And so then when you kind of ask a couple questions and you think back a few layers, and find out, well, do you know, you know, what herb your people took when they got a cold, right? And and some people know and some don't. And the reason I'm saying this is because I want us to understand that colonization and, and oppression in that way affects us all. We've all had something stripped of us in order to maintain the kind of power that is in place because they want the resources from the land and the people. And that is traumatic. And so to recognize that um, is healing. To have somebody say, yes, this has been done intentionally, it is healing. Um, and it adds to our our resolve to work for change, right? To, to know that I'm not broken. I'm not, just because I was sexually abused for a decade doesn't mean that I am broken. It means that there was a lot of things at play over many generations and many years that created an environment where that violence was able to happen. And, and we have to we have to keep the focus there that we're not broken as individuals once we've experienced violence like that. So yeah, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> I I'm so glad um, you brought that up. And one. I jot, I've been jotting things down now too, Christina, as you talk, because I don't want to miss anything to say. I have thoughts pop up and got to jot them down now. Um, but one thing you said um, right off the bat as you started talking about spirit and, and how that can't be broken, 
and um, then you came back to the fact that we aren't broken, you know, and we are we are just working on mending things. It's not it's a wound, you know. Brokenness is not something that we should be ashamed of actually it's something that we should be proud of that we're working through and that we're still here showing up and doing that hard work because the work on our planet is not to sit behind a desk and do work the work of being on this planet is to show up and be human and carry all of those those wounds we have and the real work then is helping to heal those wounds you know and that's why i was so excited to be a part of these podcasts because that's the focus but one thing you said is more power than any human being has, you know, more power than any human being has is the power of spirit to heal, right? Because you're absolutely right. It's your, when I started my own healing journey, no person outside myself was going to do it. <laughs> you know, it came from within and, and, and some of that was really icky. I had to sift through a lot of shadow stuff, right? But I, I, that's where, that's where the strength lies. And then I actually have a question for you, Christine. So you're talking about um, navigating your 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 moms and your grandparents and the trauma that they've experienced and the abuses that they experienced. What is what does that look like for you? Like, how, what is your role in navigating that? Because um, I've spoken to on the on the podcast I recorded last about my own experience with trauma and then how me starting to look at my stuff. And, and give voice to it with my own family helps them to look at their own like because before it was like we, we 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 put it behind closet doors and we didn't talk about it it was just dark in there right and as soon as I opened my dark closet and started cleaning out things it almost um, it, it was sort of like a license for people in my family to be comfortable talking about their own so I'm just wondering in your experience what has that been like for you navigating that process with your relation Oof, that's a that's a big question well you know without going into like a, a whole lot of detail I mean so my grandpa was in the boarding schools right so he was whenever he spoke his language he was beaten or put soap in his mouth or forced to kneel on rice right anytime he spoke Anishinaabe so when he got out of boarding school he of course was not going to teach his children how to speak our language right um, and I think that that's the part that helps me the most is to understand the, the legislation that was passed and how much money was allocated through Congress to assimilate us as a people. Um, that is literally what heals me the most is because I can be mad that he um, perpetrated on members of my family throughout the generations, right? I can be mad about a lot of things, the ways that my family members have coped with the violence that they have experienced throughout their lifetime. I could be mad about all that. Mm -hmm. yeah, there is woundedness there. There is healing work there. But you have to keep the, the, the focus on the fact that it was common practice to remove Native children from families and, and give them away to farmers as labor, right? And And the violence was... There was no consequences for the violence that those, that those people um, perpetrated on our kids. And so the cycles of violence or the cycles of what, how you learn to toughen up and harden your heart, um, that is real. And I guess I, I can just say it reiterated that when I understood that it was policies and legislation and money allocated towards it, that helped me understand that this is systemic, this is not individual. My, my grandpa, even though he caused harm, was a human being in a spirit who came to this earth for a particular reason, right? His humanity cannot go away in my eyes. Even, even my own harm doers, I had to do a lot of processing and a lot of healing to understand that they, are, they too are human beings and spirits who came to this earth with a journey of their own. And I... I can't control that. What I can control is how I live my life and the work that I do to try to fight for change. I guess that is that is how I have survived it, right? Um, to have those conversations that I'm afraid to have, right, with my mom. Um, 
it's scary. You don't want to bring things up that are going to hurt others, that are going to cause other people pain. But there's something very cleansing because we all want to know that we are seen. You know, my mom, when I disclosed my violence, she believed me the second the words came out of my mouth. She just grabbed me and held me and she she just held me for the long time. But then she said, well, what do you want to do? without question and that changed the trajectory of my journey that that she believed me um, I mean, all the violence that she had experienced in her life she didn't have any tools and how to respond to my sexual abuse right um she followed her instinct and she believed me and so to open those conversations up in a way um is scary and yet they can be very healing and you can't me myself i can't control what other people's um work is and journey is but i can be open and honest and loving because because we all want to be seen we all want to matter we all want to know that our lives are worth it yeah that's kind of how i've that's just a little piece of some of it anyways yeah no and thank you for answering it and i know it's 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 tough stuff and we're here to do that on this podcast in particular, and it's a safe space. And so um, thank you for um, answering that difficult question. And part of the reason I ask it, too, is because I think that's where we're at in, in, in this human journey on this planet, which is a beautiful place to finally arrive, given what our history has looked like, right? And as a side note on our history, um, I can attach it, and we can add it to the podcast notes, but... Men in the Sacred Hoop has a really fantastic uh, manual that has a lot of the history of colonization and a lot of the, the things that have happened over the years. Um, and I can, again, I can add that. Um, but what I what I want to say, too, um, in regards to the question I asked you, Christine, which is, you know, what does that look like navigating our ancestors, and our living ancestors, our relatives? What does that look like helping them navigate or just even holding space for them to navigate some of the traumas they've experienced. Because for me, and this is just full disclosure as an individual, I believe that's a huge part of my soul's journey is to help others um, process their grief because a lot of us don't know how. Um, And I am a perfect example of that. I didn't know how until I opened up enough and was vulnerable enough for spirit to teach me. And so I have taken what I learned from within myself and from the spirits that guide me and I speak to and pray to, and I have brought that to my mom and I brought that to my dad and I've shared that with them. And, and I mentioned this on my, my podcast before, um, before that it was, um, it was oblivion. They were caught in the cycle that is really easy for all of us to get caught in, which is the cycle of society and culture, right? You you get up, you go to work, you do this, you do that, and you just you continue on through the days of your life and at the end of your life then you go, Whoa, whoa, whoa <laughs> you know, where did it all go? And, and 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 a lot of that unprocessed grief dies with you. It 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 and I believe that's part of the transgenerational trauma is if we don't process it and expunge it and let it go from our spirits, it's carried on and somebody somewhere along the line is going to have to expunge that and get rid of it, right? And so that's why I brought that question up to you is is because how we do navigate it is exactly what Christine mentioned is it's having the difficult conversations, knowing that, okay, this is probably going to kind of tear a scab off for a horrible gross analogy or rip a Band-Aid off that you don't necessarily want to rip off on your mom's arm or help her rip off, but it's the safe people that can do it. And if I'm that person, which I was for my mom and my dad and actually for my sister as well and other people, not that I'm bragging, but it's just, it's important for us to acknowledge that if we are the people that can have those brave conversations with the people that matter to us, that's where I see the healing happening in, in earnest. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like in my journey, you know, you can't force somebody to do their own work. What we can do is be a safe person and be available and be open and be honest, be transparent. Right. And so I have, I have just done my best to be that, 
that person, but also, you know, in our work at the coalition, we have a native focused 40 hour sexual assault advocacy training that we are, I'm super passionate about it because it gets at the complexity of sexual violence in Indian country. Because again, I feel that it is so important that it, this cannot be individualized, right? This is so systemic. Yeah. yeah planned and diabolical that we have to recognize and acknowledge and address and work to change the, the policies that are in place, right? And that gets at real complex work around poverty and incarceration. I mean, there's a lot there, but it goes hand in hand with the individual healing work that has to be done. Um, they are not separate. They are hand in hand and that spiritual work is all a part of it as well, right? Because of that connection to land, um, you know, right now I'm holding a stone in my hand. You know, I think about the stone nation. They're a nation of themselves. Every every stone to us has a spirit, right? And this particular stone has a smooth side and a rough side. It's like shaped up in a heart. I know y'all can't see it, but I I run my fingers across both sides, and it's such a perfect analogy for me, right? Like sometimes it's scratchy and rough and sometimes it's smooth right that's kind of how the healing journey goes and I think that that's a uh, also that I can keep connection that way and it's no human involved right me and my, me and this stone can have conversations and can feel one another and I trust in that um that's really important too and if we can model what that um, looks like and feels like to people around us um, without, you know, you know, we we all know that when people have experienced a lot of trauma, that they can use a lot of unhealthy coping skills, right? So, my other thing too, I mean, mom always told me this. You know, she said, watch when it comes to substances, right? Don't drink, don't do drugs, don't sleep around, right? Don't use sex as violence. Like she was just real forthright. Like, where did she learn how to do that? Where did she learn to think those thoughts, right? And so part of it is that we are constantly evolving and developing language around how to talk about things. Another thing um, we always talk about how, I'm sure you know this, there never used to be a word for grooming when it comes to um, grooming a victim, right? So now that we have that word, we can talk about it. Um, we can talk about, there was never really... People didn't talk about body sovereignty, you know, where we, you know, especially with the holidays coming up, where we force our kids to hug their uncles or whatever, or, you know, give, give grandpa a kiss and we force them to do it, right? Like we're learning now that we have to let the kids have the choice in whether they want to go give hugs and kisses. It's little things like that, that we're modeling in our own lives that are starting in the change. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to take that even uh, one step further too, what I see that as sort of bigger picture style is we're teaching ourselves to return back to ourselves. You know, it's that individual sovereignty that we've always had, yeah. but because of the society and the systems and the culture that we've been brought into, we started, you know, un unconsciously doling out our sovereignty and giving it up. And I mean, like I said before, I was raised in the dominant culture. I'm a blonde hair, blue eyed girl, you know, and I very much benefited from a lot of the dominant culture's narrative. I, I will fully admit that, but I definitely, everything in me was quaking and I was on antidepressants and having anxiety and coping and with drugs and alcohol and all the things. And then I had to ask myself, well, what the heck am I doing? You know, and it's exactly like you're talking about we were pushed to do certain things because that's just what you do. That's what the culture and society is telling us you do, whether it's hugging on an uncle or get married when you turn 22 and have pop out a kid and da-da-da-da-da, you know, and, and, and follow the trajectory. And what we're realizing now and starting to talk about is exactly what you mentioned, Christine, the body sovereignty, the straight-up sovereignty. The individual returning to, well, what do I want? What is my spirit telling me instead of the media or the president or the teacher or whomever it might be, right? Like, I feel like I should be able to be the one to, to choose.
choose what I want to do with my body. I actually remember that moment for myself when doctors were telling me things. And I'm like, why does this doctor think they know me better than I know me? That's the silliest thing I've ever thought, you know? And the fact that that didn't dawn on me until I was 35 years old <laughs> was kind of a, a sad thing, but it's also laughable. And I'm grateful for it because I, I'm, I'm not dead yet, you know? So I still have the opportunity to... To, to repair and, and teach my own children to turn back to their own truth. Well, our social conditioning to to comply or to remain silent, and especially if you've experienced violence, you know, that is compounded to, to try to be invisible, to try to stay silent because you're trying to not be hurt, right? Mm-hmm. We have learned through many generations. If you think about the boarding school and my grandpa having to kneel on rice whenever he spoke his language, do you know what that does to you know a four or five year old? Yeah. Um, psychologically, in their in their frontal lobe development, you know that's going to have a real tangible impact in how he lives his life and how he raises his children. Right. So interrupting those things and naming it um, is going to be every time that we can interrupt that that we're going to do better for our people. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Every time we can interrupt that, that's a super important way to look at it. Commas everywhere. (laughs) Yeah, it's, I mean, our, even though so much hurt has been passed through, so has our strength and our resilience, right? Our ability to dream, our ability to be curious and hungry and to follow an instinct when it pops up. Yes. You know, like, like I, I have been lucky enough to have been, you know, raised and, and feel very closely connected still to this day to my ways of life. You know, not always. I don't run around in box skin or whatever. But I, you know, I still actively practice my ways of life. And I've been gifted with that because I've had support from safe people around me to be able to do that, right? Um, and I, I can't ever take that for granted, and I want that for other people to have that safe access to our ways. And so putting the real work in, what does that look like to, to be courageous and interrupt harm when I see it around me? You know, these are all things that are just a constant work in progress, really. Yeah. Good yeah. Stuff. Yeah, I agree. And and I, um, just to speak to, to that piece about being raised and um, – share it with the way of life and being close to people that keep it safe I um I am an an envy of that because my um family heritage was taught to not be proud of it not be proud of the Native American ancestry you have like it was almost an embarrassment to talk about it even in the 90s that is totally by design right I know I know it's disgusting absolutely and to upend that is really powerful um to just defy it. It is really powerful, but it's also super difficult. I mean, even my uncles who are still alive today, you know, who live near and on the reservation, don't don't talk proudly of that, you know? And it's it's heartbreaking to me. And to have those hard conversations that go against the grain, I mean, it is so valuable for sure, but it takes so much courage and patience and also the ability to remain silent when silence is more um, powerful than speech, for me anyways. I think I'm speaking mostly mostly for my own uh, moving forward into the holiday season here, reminding myself, you know, because you get into a fighting match or shouting match, it's not going to go anywhere, you know? So, yeah, sorry, tangent. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we... That, that oppression or that silencing and invisibility, we have learned to do that to one another, right? And we are stronger when we can see the humanity in one another regardless. And that's a journey. Everybody's individual journey is going to look a little bit different, right? But as, as Indigenous people, as anybody, as human beings, right, the more times that we can just love one another and see one another for how how we are full beautiful flawed people just doing our best we're all going to be better off for it right exactly exactly because even at the end of the day too you were talking about how we're all native from somewhere 
we are all native to this earth. End of story. <laughs> you know? Like we share the earth, you guys. Come on. So we're related at that base level. Like love each other as relations of that. So true. I mean, you know, the saying, we've probably heard it from the news or folks saying water is life, right? Like water is life is not just a saying because it's a catchy slogan. Like literally our relationship to water is, it's essential. Without it, we're all goners, right? <laughs> funny joke in the family. Well, we're goners now. I mean, it's just not funny, but it is. We have to make, that's humor is one of our most healing mechanisms i would say as anishinaabe people right we have to use our humor because life is so difficult and painful sometimes so i just feel like the the closer that human beings come to understanding their own relationship to land no matter who you are or where you're from where we're going to be stronger for it right to recognize that relationship to the water to the air that we're breathing right yeah no, I completely agree with you, and I, and I think that's such an important point to make too. It's, it's no, no one culture is uh, in control or has the most connection to it. We are all connected to it. It's a matter of how much each individual decides to recognize that connection, yeah, and to, and to grow it and foster it, right? You know that that conditioning was there to condition it out of you, right? Like yeah. that conditioned it out of you as well, and yep. so. Be curious about it. Be gentle with yourself about it. And just go ask. Go feel. Go sit by the water, right? Like, we all, why do you think we go to parks or go to the beach or go to the mountains, go hiking, right? Because that vibration is real and we all feel it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and just to use my little kids as an example, you know, they're in the digital age. They're 12 and 13-year-old boys being raised. There's always something to watch always something to look at on the screen and so it's like you know pulling teeth trying to get them outside but the second I get them on that hiking trail or in the woods they're like children again the the kind of children's passion with energy and enthusiasm and they become these little whirlwinds of curiosity and creativity and it's just beautiful and that's just a small example of how easy it is to actually reconnect because mother nature the universe spirit they're always reaching for us all always there to grab our hand and we're never ready to continue that journey it's you know just remembering it and for me I talked about this earlier um I mentioned the layers and peeling off sort of the layers and what I mean by layers are where you can also look at it as like glasses perspectives of seeing through is the, the, the social conditioning those constructs that we're taught and it's so easy that that we don't even realize we're being taught. It's just the conditioning, right? We grow up in it. And so consciously removing those layers and saying, well, I don't want to think this way. I don't want to believe that I have to live my life a certain way or a certain process or step-by-step going and following exactly what the media is telling me to do. Take that off. Take that lens or that layer off and start stripping down those layers. And the more we do take off those constructs and those layers very intentionally, the easier it is for me and in my experience to then reconnect to the spirit and the soft voice inside of me that's been there the whole time, you know, encouraging me, helping me make the right decisions and following my, my, my soul's journey on the planet. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And it's not easy work. It's not easy work to... Um... You know, it, it means you have to be silent sometimes, right? You have to shut the TV and the radio and the phone and all the things that we've used as crutches to keep us from connecting, right, to, to ourselves, to our own spirit or to the spirits around us. And it's, it's, it has served us to have a, a barrier there, right? If we have experienced violence, We have needed to have protection around us of varying degrees and various types, right? I think that one of the scariest things was to shut all the noise off and just be with myself. (laughs) Same. (laughs) That was very challenging. So many years to be able to maintain eye contact with myself in a mirror, right? The, the self-hate and the rage was just so visceral that I couldn't even do it, right? And the, the times that I have been able to do it just make me cry, 
right? Yeah. To see that person worthy in the mirror just made me cry. But that is such a good self-test. I love that you brought that up, Christine, that simply looking yourself eye to eye in the mirror. I remember when I first did that myself, and I was just like, why? I just felt compelled to do it and to remain eye-locked and, and to, to really see into myself. And, and sitting there for those moments, it's super challenging, but it's such a good practice and test for yourself and then you can take it further and further and what I do and this is complete again transparency is tell myself things I know I need to hear and so often they're hard (laughs) things to say you know you're powerful you're strong you're creative you're beautiful like remind it's almost like the Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live stuff Uh if you can remember that too (laughs) but it really is cheesy as it is it is so necessary, and for me, it was extremely valuable in helping me believe in myself again because I didn't. And and the more I, um, if I would have allowed myself those distractions, those comforts, as we were saying, the television, the movies, the radio, the podcast, the TV, all of it, if I would have allowed myself to continually be distracted, which, holy cow, that's like the easiest thing on the planet to do right now is to be distracted. You know, if I would have allowed myself to do that, healing would have either never happened or taken so much longer and then my own children would have been affected more and and so on and so forth you know so that's part of that ending the trauma cycle ending that transgenerational trauma ending those things where we stand is sitting in silence even if it's just for five seconds you know like yeah like listening like okay I don't need to check my Instagram feed right now I can just literally, even if it's for three deep breaths, sit there, you know, and it's, and it builds, it builds and it becomes more and more valuable. For me, it's actually how I celebrate now. I celebrate instead of going and having a drink or whatever it might be, I celebrate giving myself yoga or going for a walk in the woods because that really is more joy to me now than anything else and I I promise I would not have been able to say that even a year ago so yeah I think there's everything to be said about just going out and being in the woods however it is be near the water or just be next to the land right Uh, there's just nothing more real and healing than that and if it's feeling uncomfortable that's all the more reason to keep trying, right? Because there's nothing in the land that is going to cause you harm, right? Right. And you know what? Actually, as you mentioned that, Christine, like if you feel uncomfortable or something is is, uh, not sitting right when you're trying this, if you're just starting to practice going out in the woods and, and practicing your own healing journey or venturing into it is ask yourself questions. Why is this uncomfortable for me right now? And then just pause and wait, pause and wait and see what comes to you, you know? And, and then what I, that's what I did. And part of it is my own curious nature. I've just, I'm a curious person in general, always have been, but I would just keep asking myself, well, why is whatever is happening over here more important than what's happening in here? Or why is that person's words, why did it hit me so hard? Or why when I walked into Target, why did it feel so gross? Or whatever, you know? And you start asking yourself these questions. And the key for me was actually waiting for the response, right? Yeah. Waiting to hear it in my own brain. Yeah. I mean, there's, oh, like, I one thing that I am so envious of is folks who can meditate, right? I have not been able to get to that point in my life where I can just be that still, right? And I think that there's no right or wrong, right? There's no, there's no time limit or whatever. It's when we're ready that we're going to be able to go to another realm of the journey, right? I I mean, I have thrown myself into my work. You know, I've always said that work is just a socially accepted addiction or socially accepted method right but it's still an addiction if you're still using anything to avoid feeling your feelings it's not healthy so do some self-reflection and and think about that spend some time pondering what am I using to avoid being in my feelings and feeling them in their fullness right to 
to instead of avoiding them or trying to get over them you know i'm using air quotes you can't see me but i'm using my fingers as little air quotes you know because a lot of times we're told to get over it or it's been so long now just get over it for whatever it is right and there's no getting over it right we have to move through it and become a part of it um because it is a part of us like the things that have hurt us are us we wouldn't be who we are without the things that I have experienced, I wouldn't be who I am. And it's okay to um, take the time you need to navigate through it. And it's, it's more effective in the long run, right? And then it comes up and it doesn't hurt as bad the next time. There's a visualization. I use a lot of visualization techniques um, for myself and, um, and also with my own children and also as a teacher. One of the visualizations that came to me recently um, for grief, because I'm a big feeler, um, probably part of the reason why I'm on this podcast, um, and so one of the things that I have trouble with is letting go, is letting go of grief and letting go of emotional difficulties in my past, and so very recently I had this vision of a dandelion, a dandelion that has already flowered and is now the seed particles, right? The big ball of dandelion beauty that it is. And I've envisioned myself as the dandelion and all those little seed particles as the different woundings and traumas and the the grief that I'm still carrying. And so every time I have something come up in my emotional body that reminds me of something from my past, I envision it as that dandelion. And I think about how... And that then forces me into a, a deeper state of sort of meditative stillness. And I and envision it and I slow down and I start slowing my breathing. And I envision blowing that dandelion and watching all those little seed particles disperse. And knowing the reality of our lives is that nothing ever is truly gone, right? So that grief, as Christine was just saying, those things are a part of us. But if I envision those traumas and those grief incidences and the emotional stuff that still impacts me blowing away and dispersing as those dandelion seeds I know they're still alive and they're being reused by the earth right they're being reborn as something new so I can let go of it while still knowing it's a part of me and just like other things we use in our life we have to let go of them in order to become something new right be replanted and regrown and rebirthed and and fuel for the next, just like the seasons, right? Fuel for the next cycle. It's the same thing I I feel with our emotional um, bodies and our traumas and our grieving. We can look at it in that way. So that just popped into my mind as as a visual um, to use for people that do like to um, be able to see things more as they move on. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Something that came to mind for me is... um, so, you know, eagle feathers are a part of our, I don't know, our spiritual practices or whatever. So, you know, as I was saying about the stone nation and each stone having their own spirit, so do our eagle feathers, right? So they're very sacred to us. They're they're actually spirits of themselves, the feathers, right? And so when I was going through all of my violence, my harm doer gifted me an eagle feather and it was beautiful. I mean, it was perfect in every way and he said that he's gifting me this because, and I can't remember exactly what he said because it was many years ago, but something to be effective because what we're doing is right. And he gifts me this feather, right? Mm. And so you can imagine the um, the confusion and the pain and the all the things that go with having been gifted this sacred, sacred, perfect, beautiful feather the embodiment of spirit and gifting me this for this horrible, horrible, horrible suffering that I'm going through. So I put that feather away in a box, in a box, in a box, in a closet for a decade, right? And I didn't, because my faith is so strong and I, I, I would feel constantly guilty about locking that spirit in them boxes in that closet, right? It really bothered me, but there was no way that I could connect to that feather, that spirit in that feather, because he was the one who gave it to me. And what happened for my healing is that I got to a place where I could open up the box and look and, and just talk to that feather, right? Just like a, just talking to 
anybody, right? And, and, and explain to them why I was feeling so much hurt and rage and I didn't mean to lock them in a box, in a box, in the box, in the closet, but I don't know what else to do. And what came to me is that I could gift that feather to somebody else, send that spirit to be with somebody else without sharing the story attached to it. Mm. And it was a way to still do right by the spirit that lives in that feather and, and to release the pain that came with it. And that was a very transformational moment for me because I understood spirit differently after that. I understood my relationships to my sacred items differently after that. Um, it, it again for me is so much about like eliminating the human component, right? But that means I had to be clear with myself and be honest with myself where I was at with things. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, thank you for sharing that. And I think the thing I love the most about that is that you, what you're exemplifying there is speaking your truth and being clear and you're speaking it to something that, you know, you had, you had shame almost, grief about, right? With this particular feather, but you were honest with it. You're like, I don't like you. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't necessarily say that, but it's the, it's the story behind it that is important and you're learning how to transmute that and be able to move through and then share it and it probably I don't know if you gifted it or not but it was probably a wonderful gift for someone I did gift it and you know and I just gifted it with all my love right because that spirit in that feather deserved to be with somebody who could be with it in a good way right and it was yeah. like, I mean I still think about that feather off and on and, and send a little loving out into the universe and, you know, hope that their relationship is strong between the person I gifted it to and that feather, you know? Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. So is there, thank you both for everything you shared. It's been just fascinating and an emotional journey to listen to. Um, it's, always heartbreaking to hear about boarding school experiences and the very non-human way that people were treated during those times and thank you for making that connection of how stuff that was done to ancestors have impacted today um is there anything that either one of you would like to share or a closing thought? I, um, I'm going to say something similar to what I said before, um, but that is genuinely, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Um, if you're someone that's listening that is experiencing themselves any form of distress, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, or know anybody that's close to them that is experiencing any distress in that way. It is the little teeny tiny steps that get you where you need to be. So it is literally the, the 30 seconds of taking a pause and, and deep breathing, conscious deep breathing, thinking about the love you're sending into your soul, into your spirit, into your physical body. You know, so encouraging those you love or yourself for that matter um, to do those things and with the holiday season around we're around people that we love but that can be challenging to us in those moments right and so even more in those moments when you feel that rising tension anger stress anxiety whatever it might be reminding yourself that it's those little little teeny tiny step away for a few minutes and take some deep breaths or go give somebody a hug and take three deep breaths while you're hugging them if you can sense that they um, are struggling in any way because it's just it's it's a marathon right and we can't get to that finish line without the tiny steps in between so to finish it off that's that's those are my thoughts um, for beginning again to to work towards a healing healing our world healing our planet healing our country healing ourselves it's it's teeny tiny micro steps that's awesome yeah, I guess I would reflect that somewhat similar is um, connect with pieces from the land, right? So that can be like finding a stone that speaks to you. You know, if you, one of our cultural practices is we never take without giving. 
that reciprocity is super essential, right? And so if you're going to, you know, go walk along the shoreline and you see a stone or something, leave a little offering for them. You know, maybe it's, maybe you have some, some granola bar in your pocket or something, you know, leave a little piece of granola bar for that stone, but that stone to hold in your hand will help you. Um, they're actually there to do work. You can do it with your water. You know, thinking about water being life, water is a spirit too. And so if you have a glass of water in your hand, you can, you can, um, I don't, I don't know if it's appropriate to use the word pray, but you can think thoughts into the water and drink it, right? I've done that many times where I needed a little extra strength or endurance or patience or a little extra love or just help me get through this next conversation and I'll be intentional in praying into the water and then take a drink, right? It's uh, very, very, very powerful to do that. And you can sit by trees. Um, those trees can hold everything, right? Our cedar, like a lot of folks have cedar trees just around. You can just take a little tiny piece of that cedar and just put it in like in between your teeth and kind of light it in your teeth, right? Just a little pick, like a, you know, an eighth of an inch piece can really, it's so healing to do that and it connects you to land in just that little tiny moment. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. I love that too. And you reminded me of one thing that I did um, during my healing journey myself is those little spruce tips were uh, just a, such a gift. I would just pop a little one little off, right? And mush it between my fingers and just inhale it because that olfactory sense for me is really powerful for healing. So oh, thank you. That's such a good point. Yeah, that's so grounding. It gets us back into our bodies with that sensory um, input, right? Because so often our brains, for well, good reason, have taken us to safer places, right? Um, but to get back into your body and to be okay being there, that takes a little work. And it's those are really good tips. Definitely. Well, thank you both for joining today and for sharing so openly and rawly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Yes, thank you for hosting us. Thank you.